are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again today. We have another show lineup for y'all, for y'all today. We have our special guest who's joining us today. Her name is Dr. Helen Ofosu. And we're going to focus on the topic recruitment and retention strategies during the big quit era. And before we dive into the topic, we're going to learn a little bit about Dr. Ofosu. First and foremost, thank you for your time. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Maya, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I appreciate you being here. So I kind of gave a little teaser of what we will be talking about today, but when it comes to you, you have over 20 years in public and private sectors, uh, just focusing on, you know, organizational psychology and just working a lot of development, leadership skills and and navigating the complex issues of workplace, you know, different, you know, X, Y, Z, bullying, harassment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of paint the picture for the audience a little bit about uh, what you do today. All right. Well, I started my own company in 2012, and I've been offering executive coaching, career coaching, and some HR work using the background I have in organizational psychology. And I mean, the truth is that I guess first and foremost, I am a psychologist, but most people would never think, oh yeah, I have an HR problem. I better find an HR psychologist. (laughs) Or, you know, they look for HR consultants, they look for executive coaches, they look for career coaches. That's why I use those labels. And those really are the services that uh, that I've been offering. Now, when you look at what you do on a day, day in, day out routine, mm-hmm. what's, what's your routine when you get up in the morning? Because everyone has their own unique uh, routine. What's yours? Well, I try to get up after a good uh, a good sleep. I aim for seven or eight hours of sleep. And I try to get outdoors, um, usually a nice long walk to really clear my head and give me some good energy to fuel my day. And generally speaking, in the mornings, I'm trying to do most of my prep work. So that could mean doing some research to make sure that I am giving the very best advice for my coaching clients. That could mean preparing for keynotes. That could mean preparing to deliver training. And if I'm working on an HR thing, perhaps like executive search, you know, trying to help an organization with their hiring, then I may be doing some of the work related to that. And then my afternoons are usually in one-on-one coaching sessions or delivering training. And in 2012, you established mm-hmm. a IO advisory services, offering services um, such as executive and career coaching, HR consulting, and speaking and training. Mm-hmm. Kind of touch on what your mission goal was to do with that uh, service. Well, sometimes we uh, were inspired to create a service that we wish existed. And that's exactly what I've done. So, you know, I was somebody who was capable in school, got a good education, was working, earning good money, but I really was not very excited about my work. Not to say that everyone has to be fully gassed up about work every single day, but I felt... uh, you know, kind of stuck and kind of bored. And I felt like I was drinking way too much coffee just to get through the day. So I myself hired an executive coach. And I was shocked when they recommended that entrepreneurship and being an executive were actually more aligned with my skills and abilities than the work I was doing in the public sector. So at the time, I was a single parent, so that really wasn't a smart time to just quit my job and try to create a practice. But a few things unfolded that gave me an opportunity to try, so I did. And that happened in 2012, and thank goodness, I'm, I'm still at it. And if anything, it's going better now than, it, than, I, than I expected. So 
you know, I guess I'm combining my love and passion towards psychology, but also my love for entrepreneurship. So uh, that's what I've been at. And working with different clients is mm-hmm. going to lead up to the next question for the top of the, sh- uh, for the show today, the big, you know, quick era, era that's going on right now. What's some of the common challenges that you've seen to be a pattern or just kind of been like maybe the starting point of of this difficulty? Well, I'm very lucky. I do two really different types of work. So sometimes I'm helping organizations. So organizations might be my client if I'm helping them, especially with hiring leaders, or if I'm you know, doing some kind of an intervention that may be related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I have that organizational perspective, but I also work with individuals one-on-one and sometimes in small groups for coaching. So as the pandemic wore on, I could hear two very different narratives. I could understand the kinds of things. In fact, this even goes before the pandemic. Generally speaking, when I'm interacting with one-on-one coaching clients, they're talking to me very unfiltered. They know that what, what they say to me is not going anywhere. So I understand the kinds of things that are frustrating, very capable, um, hardworking people. And then, of course, during the pandemic in particular, when we had this massive exodus out of the workplace, or at least out of certain workplaces, I could understand exactly why that exodus was happening. And a lot of it linked back to how people were being treated at work. And so I also covered that in my book. But um, when I when I talk about uh, the one-on-one stuff, the executive coaching and career coaching, certainly over the years, there have been certain recurring themes and issues that come up again and again and again. So things like dealing with the imposter syndrome, um, navigating professional boundaries, dealing with toxic workplaces, uh, navigating the workplace when you're an underrepresented person. So maybe you might be a black person, another person of color, um, you know, a member of the pride community or what have you, and you're just underrepresented. And things often play out differently for, for these people. It, so I don't want to go on forever and ever. Is that, is that a good answer? No, it's perfect. And, and okay. going back to uh, the uh, book, you you written the book, uh, How to Be Resilient and Your Career Facing Up to uh, Barriers at Work. And you kind of touch on little, uh, different issues that can occur at work. Mm-hmm. Driving to how people get to that that point where they just can't take it no more, because that's I believe um, is part of the equation when people decide they just want to stop doing this and they don't want to go further. Mm-hmm. Touch a little bit on how this book can help someone overcome that, recover from that, or prevent that. Well, you know, if somebody reads this early in their career, then hopefully they will stay on the right side of many of the most difficult things that happen to people at work. But most people are going to be reading this book and picking it up because one or two of the chapters kind of align with a problem that they're dealing with. And certain problems are kind of deep. And they're not so friendly for just going online and and doing a Google search and getting a complete solution. So, for instance, um, something I talk about that's not very popular is called the glass cliff. And this is something that impacts women and racialized people in particular. And so the gist of it is that sometimes those folks, the women and and the racialized people, recognize that leadership opportunities don't come around very often. So sometimes when these opportunities do come along, they want to grab on because they're not sure when the next opportunity will come. And so often, I shouldn't say often, but sometimes these these uh, these opportunities are actually kind of tainted. These are the ones that I call the glass cliff because there's something kind of treacherous about the opportunity. It's usually high visibility, high risk, and 
in a sense, because sometimes racialized people and women are treated as, you know, kind of second la- second class citizens, it's easier to put them into these positions so that if and when they fail, well, too bad for you, we'll just bring in the next person. So it's kind of these opportunities that, you know, they're basically, they're poisoned. People don't have the resources or they're extremely risky and they're treated as expendable. And you're using your experience of over 20 years of helping employers acquire talent and coaching professionals through difficult career situations. And these are layers of of issues. So based on your experience, it's not like one shoe fits all. It's, It's unique to the actual situation. Absolutely. And, and going back to your, your earlier question, because I probably went off on a bit of a tangent, <laughs> but, you know, I think that there are certain problems where people get frustrated of putting up with things that are, you know, not getting the, re- not getting the results that they're expecting, not getting the results they, they think they, they deserve, and or being mistreated. And so these are the things, the kind of themes that come up again and again and again and that are driving people to leave organizations where they can't see a good future for themselves and going other places where they're more valued and more accepted. And I like your point about the different uh, backgrounds of people, Mm -hmm. right? Different personalities, different preferences, just different period. And Mm -hmm. why is it so important? for uh, employers and people in leadership to understand that there are major differences in different people and how they can use that for a good advantage of a workplace? Well, I think fundamentally, a lot of hiring managers, a lot of business owners, a lot of HR folks don't really appreciate that People can contribute, like various types of people can contribute. So, for instance, sometimes the tendency is to choose somebody, choose to hire somebody or promote somebody because they look pretty much like everybody else who's already in the organization. So they kind of think the person's going to fit in great. The problem is that quite often you get better work products when you have a bigger range of people contributing to those work products. And so that includes things like age diversity, gender diversity, racial, religious, all of it. Because different people have different lived experiences that they can bring to bear. So we really should be focusing on what can somebody contribute, not what is the package of those contributions. Yeah, I think that's a, a really big issue. Yeah. Once again, let's on Refux Radio, Radio talking to our guest, Dr. Helen Ofosu. And when you wrote this book and it was time to publish, I mean, I've interviewed uh, a lot of authors and they always say the most painful part is the publishing process. And for you, how do you see today's uh, opportunities as far as the job market? where people could say, you know what, maybe it's time for me to go and turn the page. What do you say to those individuals, generally speaking, and how they can use this book as a refresher or as a, or as a guide to, to stay sharp in how they approach the marketplace? Well, there's a, there's a chapter that's focused on uh, networking and diligence. I know it sounds like a strange combination, but... The fact is that most good opportunities, good job opportunities come through different people rather than being posted online. So I think that's a smart thing to be doing throughout our careers. And I have another chapter that's focused on, um, you know, should I stay or should I go? So trying to think through some things to consider when you're contemplating a, a, a change in job or a change in career. and. You know, sometimes you have to think about, uh, well, how long have you been in the position? Are your skills still up to scratch? Have you become kind of stale? 
Uh, and one way to find out about that is when new people join, do they have similar skills and training to you or, or are they kind of, you know, making you look kind of bad? So making sure that you're doing your part so that if you choose to leave, you're competitive, right? You haven't been underperforming or, you know, just not keeping pace with, with the expectations within your field or your industry. And that ties back to today's topic of recruitment and retention strategies during the big quit era. So let's kind of let's dive on that from the employer side. When it comes to uh, recruiting the best mm-hmm. talent, I mean, we hear so many stories, right? Uh, some stories are saying it's not enough talent out there to match the skill sets we need. And then this, you know, the other side of the story from the employee side, but from your experience, when it comes to employers using recruitment processes and and trying to build that retention for their employees to stay in the long term, what's some of the things that you've seen uh, be a good stepping stone for them to go to, the, to that right direction? Well, I sometimes use the analogy of um, buying a car versus hiring somebody. You're always, most people will take some time to test drive, do some online research, kick some tires just to make sure they're making a good decision. But generally speaking, it's more expensive to hire somebody and keep them on for two years, five years, whatever, versus buying a car. And if we look at it, in my experience, most HR folks are spending less time on an HR process to choose somebody for a position relative to how much time they'd spend choosing a car. So I think fundamentally it's partly slowing down and being more clear about what they actually need from that candidate and figuring out ways to evaluate it. I think many HR folks do a pretty good job of figuring out uh, what are the basic skills required. Right, like if it's a carpentry job, for instance, I'm sure there's specific things that somebody needs to be able to do to be a good carpenter. But I think what happens is that most people don't do a great job of evaluating soft skills. So the way I think about it is that the hard skills might be things like, you know, project management or, uh, you know, carpentry from the previous example or, you know, using specific softwares or even skills that, that or they're associated with certain degrees. But in my experience, there's usually something different that differentiates whether somebody's going to be good at their work or not so good at their work. And it's all these soft skills or competencies. And so basically the competencies are how you apply what you know to be effective at work. So things like having good interpersonal skills, good judgment a good work ethic, initiative, maybe strategic thinking. And it's those kinds of things that I don't think employers pay enough attention to and don't really figure out how to evaluate them. It's one thing to get deadlines done. But like you said uh, moments ago, having those strategies, you know, like systems are meant to be evergreen Mm -hmm. until they need maintenance to upgrade based Mm -hmm. on different needs. But in general, systems are made because they work, they get you results. How important, uh, I want to say how important, what are some of the ways employers, based on your experience, identify those strengths from talent that, you know, they haven't really pay attention to until, you know, it was time to to investigate. Well, I think that's the problem right there is that I, I think a lot of employers, they don't really focus on that. They tend to kind of want to reuse the processes they've used for years and years and years, maybe because if it worked in the past, it'll work again. But that just this kind of reinforces certain biases and it may encourage people to overlook certain qualities and certain candidates. 
So I think that's a big problem with the recruitment process. And I think another problem that's kind of overlooked is that sometimes people focus on things like um, hiring people who are articulate and hardworking and determined, which are all good qualities. But at the same time, these are also qualities that if they're uh, they're they're also held by somebody who's got kind of a mean streak or they're ruthless or you know they have some unsavory bully like qualities. Before you know it, you've been a bit superficial and brought people in who, yes, they have some desirable qualities, but they have some awful interpersonal qualities. And those interpersonal qualities have a a way of wreaking havoc within an organization and can trigger a lot of discord and can trigger a lot of other people who don't want to work with this person to just leave. So that's linked to the retention issue. And I find that uh, during the big quit, The research that I've been looking at, I can't remember the exact reference, but certainly it's in the book, is that um, organizational culture has been a big reason why some people have been leaving organizations. They've wanted to leave because there's a very cutthroat style of interacting. Maybe it's it's an unjust organization, so there's no uh, recognition and no valuing of people who may have different lived experiences, so it's not inclusive. So those are the kinds of things that uh, have really been driving people to just leave organizations, even when they're getting paid reasonably well. And to piggyback on that, from the employee perspective, <laughs> do you believe those different personalities can be affected just by how they see the environment in the workplace? I would reframe it and say that employees are affected because of certain, you know, mean-spirited and counterproductive behaviors. So I think that's the bigger issue is that some people are really having a bad time at work. They're dealing with microaggressions. They're dealing with exclusion. They're dealing with being passed over for promotions because they uh, they may they may fit the criteria in terms of performance, but they don't fit the preferred stereotype or template of who gets ahead in that organization. Once again, listen, I'll be focused radio talking to our guest today, Dr. Helen Ofusu. And man, he hit some really good points. And for those who need to make that big decision, right? Mm-hmm. If they need to turn turn the page or they just need to dig deeper and see what they can do to attribute to a solution versus, you know, it's very easier to make a problem, but it takes more guts to look in the mirror and say, make sure I'm not, you know, contributing to the problem as well. What you say to those people when it's time for them to evaluate not just themselves, but how they are handling the situation at work? Well, I think often it becomes very complicated. Because we as individuals might feel like we know something is not, there's something off, right? There's something that's not really working in our favor. But depending on where you work, the people around you might be downplaying much of what you're experiencing. Or they may be pretending that everything is fine, kind of gaslighting you. So I think the first step is just getting clear on what you really are experiencing and figuring out ways to you know, find find a better place where you're not forever um, in self-protection mode, protecting yourself from, from mistreatment. Is it possible that someone can be blindsided where, I don't want to say blindsided, but they might just be blinded, immune, numbed to that where they don't even recognize it? Yeah, I think so. It's kind of like the uh, proverbial frog in a pot of water. So somebody may join an organization and things are, uh, they're okay. But then every day there's like a little bit something worse that's making them less and less comfortable. Just like how the, the proverbial frog in the pot of water gets in the water at first. It's cool and fresh. Everything's all good. But then over time, they keep turning up the temperature. And before they know it, they're almost boiling, very uncomfortable, very dangerous. 
but by then it's too late. And so I think similar things are happening to certain individuals where they they try to just suck it up and and just focus on their work. But eventually, even if you think you can kind of tolerate ongoing mistreatment, that that expression, um, death by a thousand cuts, there's some real true validity to it in terms of the science. So now they're realizing that dealing with ongoing small hurtful interactions, whether it's microaggressions, being passed over, being excluded, dealing with bullying, harassment, each of these small interactions are like a small trauma. And when you add enough of them together, the impact could be just as great as if you'd been in a serious car accident, had a very serious health issue, even been in combat. So now we're hearing about people dealing with um, post-traumatic stress disorder because of harms they've been experiencing at work. So, you know, I do think we need to kind of spread the truth that these things are not just benign. These things have a real impact. Short-term, probably um, mental health impact. Longer-term, physical. And again, these are all things that I try to spell out in plain language in my book. I, I re, I'm really hoping it's a public service announcement so that people can, you know, make sure that they're uh, doing things that are in their better interest for the long term. Once again, talking to Dr. Helen Ofoso, you can go to her website, theresilientcareer.com. And when you when you learn from people's different experiences, because everyone is unique. Mm-hmm. What is the common thread that can hold together both the employer and employee to where workplaces on a basic level can be productive where there's common ground? You know, for me, the great irony is realizing that uh, workplace inclusion is a win-win situation. I know that there are a lot of uh, folks out there that are creating a lot of polarization and making it into a political issue. But at the end of the day, when employees feel valued and included and welcome, and they're not forever figuring out how to protect themselves from mistreatment, they are more engaged and, and better able to just do their work. And at the same time, this is beneficial for organizations. They don't have to be worrying about ongoing uh, departures. They don't have to be worrying about the big quit and people leaving for greener pastures. People will be happy. They'll have plenty to keep them there. They won't be dealing with a retention problem. And turnover and retention are big issues. Those are big sources of leakage in terms of uh, spending money that's not improving the bottom line. And with that point, when it comes to employees, what are some of the values that employees should hold on to while they are contributing to the place that they work at? Because there's responsibility on both sides. Mm -hmm. What about the employee as well? What are some of the important foundational uh, pieces they should have in place as well to make sure that they are being accountable as well? Well, I mean, I, I don't think there's any excuse for not trying to be really good at your work, right? You're there for a reason. So I do believe that that excellence and that uh, that diligence and a good work ethic are are essential. But at the same time, I think many of us need to be more aware of our professional boundaries. And I know boundaries is not necessarily a topic that gets a lot of attention. But when I look at it, uh, you know, people like physicians, um, teachers, lawyers, when they're getting their training, they are also getting training on what's expected of them in that field. And that basically creates an awful lot of boundaries and rules for for how they're supposed to be engaging. But the rest of us may not have those built-in boundaries. And I think that a lot of things go off track 
when people don't have good boundaries and they end up being exploited, either in terms of workload or responsibilities or even how they're being treated by other people, linked even to uh, the bullying and microaggressions and other counterproductive behaviors. So those are the two I would think to, to focus on. Once again, I want to say uh, thank you to you, Dr. Helen Ofosu, for talking to us today. And today's topic is, has been recruitment and retention strategies during the big quit era. And I think we did justice uh, giving everybody a fair share <laughs> piece of the perspective. And I think that's important because it's not always the employer. It's not always the employee. I like the idea of me in the middle. But mm -hmm. to your point throughout the interview, it is important for individuals to kind of understand what is the breaking point. <laughs> you know, what is the final straw where it's time for you to maybe, you know, turn the page and start a new chapter. So with that, what uh, closing thoughts we have for our audience and also um, hoping what you have the readers take away when they read your book. Well, my hope is that people don't stay too long, right? So if you, if things are not going well, it's probably smart to accept it and start to take some action to try to find an employment situation that is better for you, somewhere where you are welcome, you are able to perform and all of that, and not wait until you're so depleted and burned out that it's hard for you to to move on. Once again, I want to say thank you uh, for being on the show today, Dr. Helen Ofosu. You can go once again to her website. It's theresiliencecareer.com, theresiliencecareer.com. I want to say thank you for spending time with us and keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. I wish you well on, on the rest of your podcast episodes.